Greetings everyone and welcome to Back to Ashes, my name is Phoenix. It is now that time where we are reaching the end of July, which means if you have an August birthday, please go over to the community tab on the main page of Back to Ashes. I made a post about it, so please go over there and drop your birthdays. It can include you, your significant other, your kids, recently departed from this life, and of course, all the fur babies in the world because they're little angels from heaven. <laughs> so yes, please go over there and drop your birthdays so you will have your acknowledgement in the rolling credits on the video released on August 1st. If anyone happens to drop their birthday beneath this video, it will not count. All those birthdays need to go over under the community tab so they are stored in the right place and I can find them the fastest. Cool? All right. I look forward to seeing how long this list will be. If you are new here and you enjoy what you are listening to so far, please hit that subscribe button and set the bell to all. That way you'll be reminded of every time I upload a video. Plus, it helps the channel. Thank you in advance. If you'd like to learn how to become a member of Back to Ashes or would like to tip me with a cup of coffee, that information can be found in the description below. With all of that being said, it is now time to go back to ashes. For once we arise from the ashes, we are bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person every day. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack or tuck in and get warm, and prepare for your dose of vocal melatonin entitled True Creepy Encounters. Right after this intro, there will be an ad. Or read the first story, there will be an ad. And after that, there will be no more ads within this video. Disclaimer, this video is for educational and entertainment purposes. There are these stray cats that hang out outside my apartment on a small grass patch. One night, I came outside to walk my dog and I saw a little girl lying in the grass. She looked like one of the kids from the St. Jude's commercials, pale and a little sickly. She had a scarf on her head, covering her bald head. I had never seen this girl before, and it was late at night. She was just sitting there, feeding the cat. There were three large piles of cat food on the ground. When I walked by her, she smiled. As my wife turned around to look back at her, this girl gave a creepy little smile and a small wave. By the time we got back from walking our dog, she was gone. My wife and I both had a weird feeling about it. How did she get there? She was wearing no shoes and the bottoms of her feet were crystal clean. Where did she come from and where did she go? We've never seen her before and we've never seen her since, but... The encounter has left an eerie feeling ever since. Not implying, nor do I think, she was a ghost or anything like that. It was just a very creepy encounter. Hello everyone. I'm posting my story to see if anyone has any insight on an experience that happened to me about two years ago. At the time, I was 14 years old. It was at the end of the school year and only a few weeks until we were going on summer holiday, and my class had organized for everyone to go bowling one evening after school. You could choose if you wanted to commute to the bowling alley with the school or go there by yourself. I decided to go there by myself since it's easier for me. The bowling alley was located close to a mall, and you had to walk out of the back of the mall to get to this bowling alley. Since I was getting there myself, I was quite early and decided to just walk around the back of the mall before heading to the bowling alley to meet the rest of my class. As I wandered around, a girl approaches me and says something along the lines of, Excuse me, you have such beautiful skin. What skincare products do you use? And I think I answered that I don't use anything specific or something like that. I don't mean to toot my own horn, but I do have quite clear skin and have been complimented on this before. So I didn't find this compliment too abnormal at first. 
Then she asks if she can take a photo with me. I didn't really want to, but I'm a very awkward person that hates confrontation, so I just said yes. She stops a random person passing by and asks her to take a picture of us. After she got her picture, we parted ways and I ran away from her. I thought she had been trying to rob me and push the incident to the back of my mind. About three to four months later, I was in that same mall to go to my dance class. The dance studio was located in the mall. And I see her again. She approaches me and asks if I remember her. Of course I do, but I pretend like I have no idea who she is. She reminds me about the photo, saying something like, Oh yeah, I remember. And then tell her I'm in a hurry and quickly make my way to the dance studio. Does anyone have any idea what this encounter could have meant? Was it someone who was actually innocent and didn't realize that they were super creepy or... Was it something more sinister? Any replies would be appreciated. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention. I changed my appearance a lot in the third or four months that I didn't see her. So I was pretty freaked out that she remembered me because I looked like a completely different person. So this happened when I was 19 or 20. I'm 31 now. Rarely drank or go out anywhere. But last weekend, a friend of mine who I hadn't seen in a couple of years asked me out. And we ended up going to a club on the same street where this story takes place and reminded me of it. Legal drinking age in Brazil is 18. So people here start partying pretty early. And let's face it. No one really knows their limits when they start drinking. My friends and I had gone to this club. I honestly can't remember what the name of it is, but I know it closed down a couple years back. We had a great time, and the sun was coming up as we were leaving. Most clubs here give you a credit card when you walk in, whether you put in the money you plan on spending, or they work as a personal digitab, where bartenders add up, what you've been drinking, and you pay for it on your way out. I pay for my stuff and sit outside to wait for my friends, who were taking a long time to get out, probably due to being drunk as fuck. As I'm sitting there, I notice a car across the street, two dudes on the front seats, one out of the car, trying to make this clearly drunk, out-of-her-mind girl get inside as well. She's mumbling and stumbling, struggling to keep her eyes open. And she says, no, I don't want to go over and over, shaking her head, clinging onto the car door as the guy keeps telling her to let go and get inside. That they're just going to a friend's apartment to drink some more. It'll be fun. Come on. I watch wondering if I should do something, if no one else is seeing this happening. I look at the club security guard. He looks at me and shrugs, like it's not his responsibility. I look back at the girl, and I'm really uncomfortable, but also scared. My friends are still nowhere to be seen. I'm alone, and the security guard is clearly not doing anything, and there's three of the guys. What if they decide to try and get me to go with them too? The girl says one more time that she does not want to go with them. And before I realize what I was doing, I'm getting to my feet and shouting, Hey! The guy stops trying to push the girl into the car for a moment and looks at me. She said she doesn't want to go, dude. I say, starting to make my way across the street, even though my hands are shaking and my voice is probably not the most convincing. She's our friend. She's just drunk being cranky. So oh, good. We're going to just take her to, you know, her house, he says. He seems a little nervous and not exactly angry, which makes me feel a little better or less scared. Do you know them? I ask her, and she just shakes her head. 
No. Using the door as support to keep herself up on her feet. Creek number one, the one who was trying to push her into the car, looks at me, then to his friends, who seem frustrated, but start saying, come on, man, let's go, just leave it. Creep number one, now looking a bit pissed, grabs the girl and pushes her towards me before getting into the car, and they all leave. The girl nearly falls onto her face, but I grab her and we walk back to the front of the club, my heart slowly going back to its normal rate. Only then I realize my friends had come out and were watching everything from across the street with confused faces. We all meet random people at clubs at the door walking down the street, so they probably thought I'd just met someone. I start asking her what happened, if she's alone, where's all of her stuff, and she's an incoherent mess, mumbling about losing track of her friends, her purse. She doesn't even know how she paid her tab to leave. I ask for some help to the security guard. He says he can't leave his spot. He can't do anything. I explain what happened to my friends, and they talk to the hostess about it, who begrudgingly goes and checks the lost and found. Her purse is thankfully there, minus the money she had in her wallet, and we manage to call her parents. I talk to her mom because the girl can't explain anything, and I promise to stay there until her mom comes to get her. Thirty minutes later, her mother arrives, and I've never seen someone look so relieved and terrified at the same time. She thanks me and my friends profusely and offers us a ride home, but as we lived in the next town over, she just drives us to the subway station. In the middle of all the craziness, I forgot to exchange numbers with any of them, so I've never heard of that girl or her mom again, but I hope she learned to be more careful with how much she drinks, or, or who she talks to in clubs. Also, shame on her friends for not looking out for her, or trying to find her when they realized she had been missing. Though maybe they were all just as drunk as she was? Who knows? I know what I did was probably a bit reckless, but I wouldn't be able to just watch that car drive away and live with myself. Please be safe when going out, people. And creeps at nightclubs who try to take advantage of intoxicated people. You are nothing but shit. Oh, and real quick, I'm also a girl, which is why I was so reluctant to do something. Brazil hasn't been the safest place for women for a while now. This is a long, but here goes. I'm still scared. We recently moved to Salem, Massachusetts a couple of weeks ago and had a place set up with roommates, but it fell through at the last minute and we were left stranded with a nowhere to go for the night. We walked to a nearby town to try and find a place to sleep for the night until we were able to figure things out. The boyfriend is working and I'm still looking for a job and have several interviews next week. Anyways, on to the story. So, after having nowhere to go and being desperate, it's also around 3 a.m., so my boyfriend posts a Craigslist ad, reaching out for help. I know Craigslist is risky, and this story is why. Someone responded to the ad and offered us a place, and we found our way to the address. When we got there, an old, disheveled, and very dirty-looking man was at his garage on a big hill littered with old camper trailers and abandoned vehicles. It looked like a literal junkyard. We introduce ourselves, and he tells us he's got a place in the shack in an attic. My boyfriend was sketched out, and so was I, but we were so exhausted from walking all night that we really, really needed the sleep, so we took it. The attic was filthy and freezing, 40 degrees or less, and there was a dirty mattress and some blankets, 
He said he took in a junkie couple, but they left without notice months ago. Really sketchy, but I needed to sleep. He let us sleep for the day, and when we woke up, we decided to go to a nearby McDonald's to charge our phones and see if any friends answered if we could stay with them temporarily. The guy, Richard, starts texting my phone and leaving me voicemails saying how we don't trust him and why did we leave. So I sent a text back saying we were charging our phones and we'd be back to talk to him. After that, he sent me a text saying, all in caps, I guess you don't trust me. Goodbye. I'm like, what the fuck? So I call him and explain the situation, and he starts saying how we need to come back so he can talk to us about the place. We come back, and he's very visibly drunk. He starts rambling on about how he's not a child molester and how we're stupid for going to McDonald's to charge our phones and we're stupid for buying food at McDonald's because he has food for us. I wanted to leave then, but I don't know anyone here. My boyfriend does, but his friends live with their parents and everyone said no to us staying with them. So... The boyfriend goes to the store to get some smokes, and I stayed behind to help creepy Richard with some stuff in the yard, I think it was. He starts almost interrogating me, asking would I die for my boyfriend? Do I trust him? How much do I love him? I tell him, yes, I trust him, and yes, I love him. He tells me I'm stupid and that he's just going to leave me and it won't work out. We've been together three years and are very close. He would never leave me because we're very loyal to each other. Richard then stands up and starts kind of darting around, back and forth around me, like he's staring at me and around me. Uh, kind of like he's trying to read me. I asked him what he was doing because it made me super uncomfortable. And he shook his head as if coming out of a trance and apologized. Then he said I was stupid for trusting my boyfriend. And he then says again how he's not a child molester. No one even said anything remotely relevant to this. So it was suspicious that he kept trying to stress to us that he wasn't a molester. Then he tells me that he's a mean person and has been accused of killing and raping people but that he's not a rape, but he's killed someone. I start panicking, and luckily, the boyfriend returns. We were alone in the attic, and I tell him what happened with Richard, and he's panicked, and we're not sure what to do because no one can take us in, and we didn't have enough money for a motel until a few days later when he got paid. So we try to stick it out a bit and decide if Richard try something. We can protect ourselves. Next day, boyfriend goes to work, and I'm there alone and scared. I have my phone, and I'm able to talk to my boyfriend while he's at work. Richard keeps finding excuses to come up into the attic and talk to me. He asks if I want to take a shower at some random guy's house I don't know. I said no and made an excuse about not wanting to get sick with wet hair. He asks again and again, trying to convince me, and I said, no, I'm not leaving without my boyfriend. He finally leaves me alone about it, but still keeps finding excuses to come talk to me. My boyfriend finally comes back after work, and I'm really panicked and crying and begging to leave. We'd figure something out and are able to get to his mom's. That night, Richard comes back up to the attic, saying he's got to talk to the boyfriend, and I go with him into his camper trailer with my boyfriend. There's a computer monitor hooked up to an ATV with a naked woman. There's stacks of adult pornography DVDs all over the place. The place reeks of a horrid smell we can't describe. I wanted to leave right then. Finally, we went to sleep one more night there 
and around 4 a.m. in the shack below us, we hear lots of banging and hammering and all kinds of loud noises. We're both panicked and stayed quiet since he's right below us. We hear him talking to himself in a full-blown conversation as if someone was around. No, he wasn't on his phone. After about an hour, he comes up there and starts asking my boyfriend to help him with some heavy loading of junk into a truck. The boyfriend says no and explains we're leaving. We have to be somewhere to catch the train at a specific time that morning. Richard gets visibly irritated and tries to keep us there again. Finally, we're able to leave. Boyfriend's mom gets us and I start crying and begging to play please not take us back there. She's confused because she doesn't know what's been going on because my boyfriend was scared to tell her. Finally, we tell her the entire story and she's concerned and empathetic with us. She says she's going to make sure we don't go back. This is now one day later, I'm writing this, and we've found a friend who's letting us crash for a few weeks until we save up some paychecks. I was looking on Craigslist to see about an apartment rentals, and I see Richard's ads about needing a female roommate and want pictures and such. I knew it was him because he said he was moving to Maine soon and told us a lot about his plan to move to Maine. There's currently about eight ads on Craigslist, all for him, looking for a female roommate in Salem, and he's 53 years old, named Richard and moving to Maine. This scared me even more because I don't know if he's trying to lure in females or not. If my boyfriend never showed up for work, I know I'd probably be dead now. I got horrible vibes from the man and honestly thought we'd die there. I have his phone number and wanted to see if I could find his full name to do an internet arrest search. I was unable to get results without paying, and I can't afford all that. I'm debating placing an anonymous call to the cops about his address and what he's saying about he killed someone, and everyone says he's a molester. I never want to see that place ever again. This happened to me in the fall of 2020, in the middle of the pandemic. My friend, let's just call him Jay, and I were on our way from New York City to Michigan to do a couple of vinyl flooring jobs and also scout some potential properties to renovate and flip. We were using his work truck, which was a Ford F-150. We decided to leave in the evening and make the drive all night to get to our destination. We were on the I-80, which is a two-lane highway that passes through the mountains of Pennsylvania. This highway is far from safe. It's elevated in mountainous terrain. There are constant turns. It snakes around a ton. So if you go through the guardrail, you're flying down into the darkness of a ditch. Anyway, I'm driving while Jay is trying to get some sleep. I stop at a service plaza to refuel and run into the shop really quick to get some drinks and snacks for the road. It's a little past midnight and I notice one other car refueling a few pumps away from us. It was a red or burgundy SUV. I think a Mazda or a Suzuki. But I pay it and the driver no mind as I ran back to the truck. Fast forward 30 minutes later, and I'm cruising on the left lane doing 90. Then, I noticed the headlights behind us. It was the same red SUV from the service plaza. I first don't think anything of it, but it dawned on me that this guy has been following since the service plaza. I decide to do a quick test to see if I'm being tailed or not. Since I was doing 90 consistently... I slowed down to 70 and waited to see if he passed me. The guy also slows down with me, so now I'm on high alert. 
I wake up Jay and tell him the situation. Bro, I think this guy is following us. My friend Jay is an ex-army ranger who is a lot more vigilant than me and also crazier. Immediately, he says, That's the car from the gas station. I noticed the guy was looking at you extra hard when you passed by. Okay, switch lanes and see what he does. So, I switch lanes and the SUV does so as well. Okay, slow down to a stop and pull over on the shoulder and see what he does. I listen to Jay and slow down to a complete stop on the shoulder of the highway. This fucking psycho slows down and parks right behind us. Wow, this guy has a lot of balls. He definitely has a gun on him, Jay exclaimed. Okay, pull out and gun it to 90. I have an idea, Jay says. I take stock with what we have in the truck that could be used as weapons. We had a hatchet and a machete, and each of us had a folding knife on us, but no firearms. I pulled off the shoulder and stay in the right lane as I press down hard on the gas. Jay wants me to brake check the guy, so he crashes into the back of us and then charge the car with a machete and a hatchet and hope for the best. At this point, he isn't an active threat yet. If he tries to ram the truck or shoot at it, then it's a different story, but right now, I decided against it. Jay looks around the inside of the truck and grabs a high-powered handheld spotlight and opens the back window of the truck. Okay, I'm going to light his ass up and see if we can get a good look at him. So he turns on the spotlight, and guess what? The guy's front windows are heavily tinted, so we can't get a good look at his face. Uh, yo, Jay, I'm going to switch lanes and... See if you can aim at the side. Maybe his side windows aren't tinted. So I quickly swerved onto the left lane, and as I do that, Jay turns on the spotlight again. I made sure to turn my head toward the SUV at the same time. For the three seconds we had him illuminated, I will never forget the look of this guy. He was tall, at least over six foot three, because he was hunched over the steering wheel. He had the face of Uncle Fester from the Adams Family and the hair of Kramer from Seidenville, along with a five o'clock shadow. Once he saw that I wasn't alone and that we knew what he looks like, he turned at a truck rest stop area. To this day, me and Jay get into a debate about whether I should have brake checked the guy or not. He's under the impression that the guy was a serial killer and that he ended up finding another victim instead of being killed by us, possibly a trucker sleeping in his cab. I've analyzed the situation and concluded that this guy's intentions were definitely evil. How evil? Robbery at the minimum, kidnapping and murder at the worst. Thank God I was never able to find out. What do you all think? I had an interesting morning. It has me fully creeped out, but also anxious and concerned. I live in a small apartment complex on the ground floor. All the ground floor apartments have open patios. They overlook a pond and there is a steep ish ledge from the property down to the walkway around the pond. I currently have a friend staying on my couch, which is right in front of the patio door. This morning, I woke up to my friend yelling, Get out of here! Go away! Why are you naked? Go away! This was unusual, so I came out of my room to investigate. I noted at the time, it was 5.45 a.m., it was just starting to get light out, but still fairly dark, and I see my neighbor standing on my patio, dirty and without pants. I've lived next to him for four years, and he's disabled. I was told he was in an accident years ago, but he's very frail and almost always confused. 
Very, very nice man, though. I bring him treats for the holidays and try to keep an eye out since he never seems to have any visitors. So he's standing on my patio. It took me a moment to register who he was, so I did panic for a moment. But then I opened the door and took a good look. He's got a gash on his forehead, dried blood all over the side of his face. He's barefoot and has scrapes and dirt all over him. He doesn't know where he is and keeps telling me his address and that he needs me to go with him. So I reassure him that he is home and I walk him to his door. When he opens his front door, I notice that his back patio door is standing wide open. He tells me that someone came into his apartment and walked him into the woods and then beat the shit out of him. Then he says that he met someone at a bar and they put him in their car and threw him into a ditch. He keeps going back and forth between these two variants and nothing really makes sense. He asked me not to call anyone and at first I wasn't going to because he seemed to be okay and I'm pretty sure that what really happened is he either was drunk or disoriented, or he was sleepwalking, and he walked off the ledge to the edge of the property. But after talking to my roommate and thinking on it, we called the police for a welfare check. He told the cops the same jumbled story, this time throwing in that maybe the people who helped him had done it. But... He refused any medical care, and so eventually the police left. And I am still shaken. What a way to wake up. I hope he's okay, and I sure as hell hope no one really walked into his apartment and assaulted him. I just had to get that out. It's been a busy day, but I haven't been able to speak to my neighbors since this morning. I plan to stop by tomorrow and see how everything is going. I've really been wanting to share the story for some time now, but haven't really found a good outlet until now. The people involved don't really like talking about it. It's upsetting and doesn't make us look good. But I just think it's a great and awful story at this point. Sorry this is going to be a long one. And also keep in mind that names have been changed to protect personal information. About five years ago... My wife and I went on a weekend camping trip with our two closest friends, another married couple. The campsite is just outside of Yosemite and absolutely beautiful. The beauty of it and creepiness of it is that you take a dirt road for about an hour and a half off the main road to get to it. It's extremely secluded, but never felt threatening. It's a really popular campsite so there were always people around, especially in the summer when this occurred. The first day was awesome. I don't remember exactly what we did, but I remember having a great time. The campsites are all fairly close together and usually separated by various shrubs, etc. I remember we were all pretty pumped about the site we got, as there were no neighbors on the side. It was just the forest, and no one occupying the site closest to us. This is uncommon, as these campgrounds stay fully booked throughout the summer. Day two started normally. We had breakfast, then headed to the lake for a couple of hours. The lake was about a 20-minute hike from the main campground. When we got back at around two-ish, we noticed that the site next to us had a silver rental car parked on it. We didn't think much of it and went about making a fire to cook with. At some point, we noticed that the occupant of that site next to us, a pretty average-looking white guy, maybe early 40s. Honestly, he was so average-looking that it's hard to even picture him. We all immediately caught on to the fact that he was constantly looking over at us. My friend Dave even made a comment to me under his breath 
You notice this guy keeps looking over here? I remember feeling a little uncomfortable, as we were all still in bathing suits from the lake, but made a conscious effort to ignore it. It's worth mentioning that we were a little buzzed and drunk, not out of control or anything, just feeling pretty good. Throughout the afternoon and into the evening, we continued to notice the guy constantly looking over at us. In hindsight, Dave or I should have called him out. This story doesn't make us look great, but whatever. I had been stressed at work prior to the trip and really didn't want to let some creepy dude throw off my relaxed vibe. It's stupid, I know. The alcohol cooped with the fact that we honestly kind of felt bad for him led us to not confront him. Yes, it was very creepy, but I told myself he was just an awkward, lonely dude. Aside from the staring, there were a couple of mildly weird incidents that occurred leading up to the very weird stuff. The first was that, at some point, he left his site to go do whatever. While he was gone, a girl, probably in her 20s, our age, walked by and snapped a picture of his license plate. I remember asking her if she needed anything, and she smiled awkwardly and kept walking. Dave and I both thought this was very odd, but were preoccupied with beer. Later into the evening, around seven-ish, I think, the camp host was doing her round checking people in. She checked us in and moved on to him. I remember us all eavesdropping intently to hear what they were saying. I think we just wanted to hear what this creep sounded like. He kept asking questions about the bathhouse. We didn't know that there was a bathhouse or even what a bathhouse was, but we had like a hundred different questions about it. Where is it? How late is it open? Is it private? Maybe not that weird, but in context, definitely odd. The sun started to go down. We were all drunk, so we weren't too concerned with creepy dude anymore. At one point, we went for a walk and noticed him snooping around what we believed to be the bathhouse. Now, I would call out this kind of behavior, but again, I was drunk and five years stupider at the time. We all laughed and talked about how creepy he was. Back at the site, we continued to drink and have a good time. At one point, the guy starts eating beans aggressively out of a can in the light of his single lantern. No fire. He looked right at us while he was doing it, and Dave and I kind of snickered to each other at how weird it was. I don't think the girls noticed. Eventually, we decided to go to bed. I think the guy had left his sight at this point. I kind of remember us making jokes like, I better not wake up to that dude looking into our window. <laughs> My wife and I slept in our SUV with the seats folded down. Dave and Sarah slept in the camper shell of their truck. I remember feeling a little creeped out as I fell asleep, but shrugged it off. At around 2.30 a.m., both my wife and I were jolted awake by what we thought was a woman's scream. We look at each other and ask if the other had heard it. We came to the conclusion that it was probably people at some other site being loud and decided to go back to sleep. As I was trying to go back to sleep, I started feeling very unsettled. I decided to go out of the car and take a look around. I cracked my window, trying to be as quiet as possible. I'd gotten about one leg out of the car when I heard faint but direct whispering coming from Dave and Sarah's camper shell about four feet away. I froze and then heard it again. I eventually realized that they were trying to tell me something. I whispered back, What? I then very clearly heard Dave say, Start your car. I instantly realized that something was very wrong. So, rather than ask questions, I climbed back into my car to start it. Right away, 
Dave and Sarah burst out the back of their camper and frantically jumped into my car. They told me to drive. They were too freaked out to explain anything, so I just drove kind of aimlessly. Eventually, I pulled over, figuring we were far enough away from whatever had freaked them out. Finally, Sarah calmed down enough to tell us what had happened. As she put it, she was awoken by a light coming from Creepy Dude's campsite. Apparently, he had set up lanterns and flashlights to spotlight himself, completely naked, masturbating in the direction of our cars. She also mentioned that he was flaccid and not able to finish. A very gross detail, but I feel it's important. My apologies. It gets weirder, though. At some point, he stopped and turned off the lights and began using a flashlight to signal across a small ravine that the campsites backed up to. I'm talking like Morse code or something. Across the ravine, an old RV began using its headlights to signal back. Dave was awake by this point. I questioned them on this detail, and they both said it was very clear that they were communicating. After that, he turned off his light. Keep in mind, it is absolutely pitch black out there at night. After a few minutes, they heard footsteps around their car, followed by a hard tap on the window. That is what caused Sarah to scream, hence waking me up. At this point, I decided that we needed to call the police. The problem was, there was absolutely zero cell service at this campsite. Furthermore, it was about an hour and a half up a service road from what was already a very remote part of the state, so leaving at night wasn't an option. We decided the best course of action was to alert the camp host. We drove around and eventually found the trailer she lived in. She was understandably confused to be woken up at 3.30 in the morning, but very responsive. She mentioned that the guy was really weird when she checked him in and called the police on her satellite phone. Apparently, there was a massive wildfire burning that weekend and the police said they wouldn't be able to send anyone out until sunrise. The camp host said there really wasn't anything she could do beyond calling the police. It really sucked to hear all that. Basically, we were stuck in our car in the pitch blackness while some crazy masturbating dude was out and about, not to mention whoever was in that RV. One more really weird thing happened. At around 4 a.m., we were all still sitting in my car when a man in a hood walked right up to the window. The second I noticed him, I turned on my engine and headlights. He ran off into the trees. We all sat in my car until sunrise. Once it was light out, we went back to the site to pack up our things. His car was still there with blankets hung in all the windows. The whole thing just felt gross, and we wanted to get the hell out of there, so we quickly packed up and left. A couple of hours after we left, I got a call from the police. They said they went out to the campsite and questioned the guy. He said he was simply showering. The cop told me that there was nothing they could do. It was our word against his. He also questioned the people in the RV. They said they didn't know what he was talking about, but mentioned that, and I quote, a very rude camper screamed in the middle of the night. The whole experience with the police was frustrating. I tried following up. I even tried getting help from a family member who's a sheriff, but even he said there wasn't anything they could do unless that particular police chief really wanted to investigate this guy. So, that's my story. I learned a lesson about being polite when someone is making you feel uncomfortable. Nowadays, I am much more aggressive with creepy people. I also know it's easy to hear this story and wonder why Dave or myself didn't just confront the guy. 
especially when he's literally masturbating at the car you're sleeping in. I don't know. I wish we would have showed more courage, but honestly, it was just really scary in the moment. I'm okay with admitting that. Now, I think it's kind of funny just how stupid we were and how bizarre the whole situation was. I also feel fortunate that no one was hurt. Clearly, we were dealing with a very fucked up individual who had accomplices. I can only imagine what their end goal was and what they would have been capable of doing. I also think that they had done shit like this before. I just really wish the police could have done something about it. This happened a few months ago. It was a few days after Christmas. My mom had asked me and my girlfriend to house sit and watch the dogs for her while she went on vacation for a week with her boyfriend. We agreed, and the first few days were pretty uneventful. My mom's house is on the edge of a rural upstate New York town, so really the only big thing that happens is road work. It was probably the third night there. My girlfriend and I were on the couch. She was on her phone and I was playing Pokemon Shield on my Switch. It was probably at around 12.30 a.m. when suddenly we hear footsteps from outside. Someone with really big and heavy boots had stepped up on the porch. The way my mom's house is laid out is that there's a couch against the wall with windows on either side of the couch. On the other side of that wall is the front porch. So, this guy is right behind us. He stamped around some and got really close to the window on the left side of the couch and grunted, Shit! Fuck! in a deep, angry voice, and then stomped off. My girlfriend and I froze. But after about five seconds of registering what just happened, we got up and turned off all the lights in the house and went to the laundry room where we knew no one could see us. After a little bit, I decided to go out to a different room and look out the window to see if we could turn the lights back on. When I look out the window, though, I saw this big burly guy shuffling down the sidewalk opposite the house. In his hands is a plastic bag. Keep in mind, this is 12.30 a.m. in a rural Blackwater town, so none of the stores around are open for him to get to. This guy continues doing this awkward shuffle while holding this bag. Then, suddenly, he starts moving really nimbly in an almost cartoony manner across the street towards a parking lot near my house and then disappears. I go back to the laundry room where my girlfriend is and tell her what I saw. I bring her back to the window I was looking out of to see if we can find him again, but he's still gone. We check other windows around the house to see if he's still outside any of those. My girlfriend is looking out of a window on the other side of the house when she says she sees him, but he's walking away. We try to collect and discuss whether or not we should call the cops when suddenly we hear knocks on the door on the other side of the house. We race to the door and we could hear the doorknob jingling. Thankfully, it was locked. One of my mom's dogs starts barking and going insane. He's a small dog, a rescue that growls at anything foreign. He has a loud, ear-piercing bark, so I think that scared him away. We called my mom and asked her what to do. We debated calling the cops, but cops in our area are notorious for not really doing their job, so we decided not to. My mom also encouraged us not to because she thought he was just someone drunk and or high who didn't know what he was doing. 
While this wouldn't be the first time someone showed up drunk at the door in the middle of the night. Gotta love small towns, right? I don't think he was. I don't know what this guy's intentions were, but I'm glad we didn't find out. And that, dear listeners, bring the close to these true creepy encounters. Before I go any further, I would like to give a very special shout out to the elite members of Back to Ashes. Christy Elliott, Sugar Spike, Tina Mead, Samantha Play, Stephanie McLaren, Tammy Slayton, Amy Klimko, Anita V, Dova Khaleesi, Ida Smith, Luz Crispin, Patty's niece, Denise S, Call Me Carter, Corpse Lover, and Cindy Cleveland. Thank each and every one of you again and again and again for being the pillars of which Back to Ashes stands on. To the other subscribers and listeners and supporters, thank you so much. For without you, I would not have a voice. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you're awake, I hope you've enjoyed this selection. Until next time, please take care of yourselves and stay safe out there. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all.